I'm Simone Lee. I'm here to talk about the Free People's Medical Clinic, which I created with um, Creative Time last year, um, right down the street in Stuyvesant Mansion. Uh, I'm a visual artist. I have an object-based practice, making sculpture and video. This is a still of a video I made with Chichu Ganesh. Um, I describe my work as an ongoing exploration of black female subjectivity. And black women are the primary audience for my work. I work in an autographic mode. And I think of black women as a kind of material culture. And issues that often come up are authorship, labor, women as containers of knowledge, and women as containers of trauma. So when I was asked to make something live, which is my first time, um, I decided to focus on the legacy of black nurses. There are several antecedents to our clinic. Um, the most important one is the Black Panther Party's Free People's Medical Clinic. And ours was in large part a reenactment. Um, they had a dual strategy. One was to bring free medical service to the community and also um, advocacy against med medical injustice. So these are some images from that clinic, which um, was established across the United States in the 60s and 70s. In this case, uh, sickle cell anemia was a focus because this is a genetic disease that's specific to African Americans. And so by focusing on that, they were able to illuminate medical injustice. Um, this is the <clears throat> New York headquarters of the United Order of Tents, which is also an antecedent to our clinic. Um, this is on McDonough Street, which is right around the corner from Stuyvesant Mansion. The tents were established in 1867 by two ex-slaves, Annette Lane and Harriet Taylor. Uh, the tents are an organization that provides shelter for those who are unable to take care of themselves. Um, they have uh, operated since that time during the Underground Railroad, um, and they're still operating now. At one point, their members grew to the size of over 20,000. This is an illustration um, that was created by the artist Robert Thom, depicting um, the work of Miriam Sims, who's considered the father of, of modern gynecology. Sims began his practice by experimenting on black women as slaves between 1845 and 1849 without anesthesia. Uh, three of the slaves we know, Lucy, Anarcha, and Betsy, all underwent multiple procedures without anesthesia, <coughs> which had already become readily available. Um, Sims' records show that he operated on Anarcha 30 times. We don't have Confederate flags, but we do have a statue of Mar Marion Sims in New York um, on Fifth Avenue and 103rd Street. In response, Chanel Portia, who's permanently established in the Sivan Mansion, offered well women care in our clinic and also offered kits uh, to support self-exams. So this is a self-defense through uh, small, powerful gestures, uh, the slow accumulation of self-knowledge. This is the spectacle of the death of a black woman in Kings County Hospital in 2008. Um, after losing her job, Edith Green became despondent and decided to check herself into Kings County Hospital. She waited there for 24 hours without receiving care and collapsed and died. And the reason why we know about it is because she laid on the floor for 45 minutes before they removed her body. Um, the New York Times wrote about this, and they wrote, waiting may have killed her. And so I have to assert again that I do think a major cause for black women, of the death of black women, is obedience. Naomi Jackson wrote about um, her death on the occasion of our clinic. This is Josephine English, who many of you may have known through her activism in our neighborhood. She, um, we're, she's going to be introduced in the video I'm playing. 
Um, another thing about the collection of knowledge is uh, documentation and making sure that you narrative your you write the narrative of your work. And so we asked filmmaker and scholar Madeline Hunt Ehrlich uh, to document our clinic. So we're standing in the home of Dr. Josephine English. Uh, she was the first African American OBGYN uh, to have her own practice in New York. This is her home. It's owned by her family still. And it has had many incarnations since she lived here. She, it has been a community center, a senior center, um, and now the Free People's Medical Clinic. The more we're in touch with ourselves, the more we already know what it is to heal us, what it takes to heal us. I grew up in uh, Guyana. And one of the, my favorite things was to like listen to my grandmother's stories. And so folk stories have such a role in healing. Um, and remember that medicine wasn't always written down for us, right? A lot of times medicine, especially in African-American communities or indigenous African-American communities, medicine was sung, right? We weren't allowed to write and read, so we sang to each other what medicine did. Um, and that's how medicine was passed on. The songs themselves are medicine, as is the herb that was sung about. And so a lot of this work takes in those folk stories and those singing and remembering what it is to be in touch with self. Um, I love the way Karen Rose, who's the master herbalist who was speaking, gives an epistemology of knowledge, form, and self-care. At the core of many black aesthetic cultures is the form or the style is just as important as the information that's being presented. The song itself becomes the medicine. Uh, we offered an array of services that included well woman care, HIV testing, counseling, blood pressure screenings, folk and modern dance, Pilates massage, acupuncture um, by the wonderful Julia Bennett from Third Root, yoga and um, herbalism. <clears throat> so in all these examples, I've been discussing a lack of empathy for black pain. Um, also, when we were forming the clinic, some studies emerged which described um, a lack of empathy in most white and black people for black pain. So it's at a point in which black people are starting to um, not empathize with their own pain. Um, so in response, um, when we have Stephanie Battle teaching yoga or Amy Meredith Cox teaching dance, um, when we create a physical, uh, an awareness of the body, it's not just a physical healing, but in, in addition, it's uh, emancipatory. In addition, for we created the Waiting Room magazine, which um, many scholars and artists participated, including Alondra Nelson, Vanessa Agar Jones, uh, Nancy Mutiti was the designer of the magazine. Uh, Robin Cost Lewis included a poem. These are some images for the magazine. Um, and finally, <clears throat> on the last day of the clinic, um, two um, of the original doctors who worked in a clinic in Brownsville in the 70s came. And they explained that the facade was covered in sandbags because they were so in battle with the police, um, much more of a bunker um, than a hospital. Um, and so thinking about um, this, I imagine that it may be necessary for us to also consider going underground in order to explore our own knowledge. Thank you. to experience this project it was phenomenal oh, wow. um, and I grew up my primary form of health care as a child was the emergency room um, and clinics right and so um, 
Highlights magazine was the magazine. <laughs> and I would go inside and I would you know, open it up to do one of the puzzles or one of the line drawings and they would all be done. But when I went to this clinic, it's like critical race theory in the magazine. <laughs> it's like amazing. Um, so do we want to do question one or two? We should do two, I think. Two? Yeah. OK. So when, um, when Simone um, uh, talks about her primary audience being black women, I have to say my response was, she made that for me. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and my most complex self. And so let's talk a little bit about like, why you've chosen to say that. I say that speak. repeatedly, and I know that um, I'm not supposed to. Um, but I really feel that um, black women are complete and are, are human. Um, and so I feel like by establishing that as a primary audience, then I'm invoking the humanness of black women. Um, not to exclude anyone, but just to welcome everyone into our fabulous world. <laughs> Um, and this fabulous world, we were talking backstage, I was saying I, I'm so excited because, you know, the assumption is that by identifying your audience as black women, um, is that somehow it is exclusionary, but we talked about that it's actually not. Not at all, and I think if I can identify with Huck Finn, people should be able to identify with me. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>